Hello everyone, welcome, mabuhay, bienvenidos to another episode of the First World Manila podcast. First World Manila, the aspirational brand that also makes learning about the Philippine economy, uh, long-term economic planning, urban development, and cultural revitalization interesting to a wider audience in the Philippine public. And of course, we need all this so that we need to follow all these three things in, in order to strive and attain a higher standard of living for everyone in the country. Um, I am Ramon Rodrigo Calo Cuenca, CFA. I'm the founder and director of First World Manila, and this is what we do for this brand. Um, we do this through podcasting, like what you're listening to now, uh, vlogging and fine art and you have to excuse me if I'm half awake because I'm exhausted and I've had a pretty rough week and another rough week ahead just lots of things happening although that's good obviously if it's a sign that you're busy with business means that you're you know it's a good sign obviously but of course I'm committed to this podcast this weekly podcast so here I am for you guys okay um Today, we're going to be talking about economic policy. So this is an economic policy episode in this podcast. And this one is about the ease of doing business in the Philippines. And as we know, it's not easy to, to do business here in the Philippines. I mean, everyone, I mean, most of you are local, so you, you know that. But for all of the philams or foreigners listening, it's really, really hard to do business in the Philippines. How hard? Well, we... Uh, rank pretty low in the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Index, as we'll, we will find out later on this podcast. So a little background to this episode. Um, two weeks ago, I went to an event hosted by Kickstart, which is, it, which is a, uh, I believe, an incubator here in Manila. And they have, they have this, uh, I, guess, I guess it's a monthly, um, a monthly networking event and with, with speakers as well for people in startups and business and tech here in Manila. It's called Raid the Fridge, and it's literally, <laughs> it is pretty much raiding the fridge. I mean, it's bigger than just a fridge, but there's free food, and everyone's networking, and there are obviously guest speakers. And this past, the past month, so two weeks ago, there was the event uh, for Raid the Fridge was actually, the topic was ease of doing business in the Philippines. And uh, I attended that talk, and it was being, uh, the, the speaker was Bill Lewis, who is the, I'm, I'm just reading this from the from my notes, the private sector co-chairman, outgoing, so he's outgoing, of the National Competitiveness Council and the Chief Resilience Officer and Advisor for the Philippine Disaster Resilience Foundation. So someone who's quite high up there in government and, and an important position helping, uh, with, with one of his roles being to make the Philippines more competitive business-wise. Um, and before I go further, I should mention that it's important, and I've highlighted this, highlighted this both in this podcast and this uh, and my vlog, that uh, there is a link between business competitiveness and a higher standard of living between, uh, within countries. Uh, generally speaking, and I mean my my interpretation of that is that you know a government that's able to make life easier for its citizens doing business generally. Uh, is capable of making life easier in general for its citizens. So, uh, so again, ease of doing business is important, not just for business, which is which is important, but also as sort of a rough indicator on how competent or how good a government is. So, uh, let's, the second speaker also who joined Bill Lewis was a Miss uh, Noya Terado, who was uh, part of the part of DTI, the Department of Trade and Industry. She's an executive part of the. I believe she's part of the Executive Council. And um, she is the undersecretary of the Trade and Investments Promotion Group. So again, promoting industry in our country. So these two people were kind enough for, to grace us with their presence and really talk to us private sector people. So, and if you're watching me on YouTube, you will see behind the, the video of me, you will see a, a PowerPoint presentation uh, that uh, Mr. Luz gave uh, that during that event. So this is going to be, I'm going to be, go, be, going, be going over some of these slides, uh, just a couple of them uh, during this podcast. Uh, so it's gonna be slide heavy. And for those of you listening uh, audio only, 
I will leave a link uh, to my website where you can where there will be screenshots screenshots excuse me of some of these charts for your reference but I will be again I'll be as I'll be talking through this podcast I will be sort of describing the charts for all of you audio only listeners all right so um, and for most of this basically what, what I'm going to be doing for this episode I'm just going to be going over the the what they were talking about in this presentation and you know and then maybe add a few of my comments and then leave a overall like you know a summary of uh, my of my thoughts at the end so uh, let's let's get through this okay the beginning of the talk uh, Mr. Luz is talking about how competition is important so the Philippines and the compete with other countries such as the our ASEAN neighbors for investment trades and jobs Obviously, um, we've competed. We're doing quite well in some of these uh, sectors. I mean, he mentioned the BPO, so business process outsourcing, like call centers, and KPO, uh, knowledge process outsourcing. I'm assuming he's talking about. I don't know if I don't know if like higher value add services uh, fall in that, but I'm assuming he's, that's, that's stuff like back office and accounting that's being outsourced to the Philippines. So we actually get uh, jobs from, from uh, we've actually competed successfully for jobs in these two arenas, uh, which is one reason why the economy is doing relatively okay and we have something of a middle class right now. So that's good. The Philippines also competes for tourism, of course. And Mr. Luz was, it was interesting because he also talked about how the Philippines competes for its own people. 10 million people 10 million Filipinos have left the country to find better opportunities abroad. So we want, obviously, we want these people back. Uh, we want, especially, you know, some people who are very skilled have left the country. And, of course, we would like them to come back here to help and build industry here and contribute to society. But, again, we have to offer them a better deal than going abroad. Um, okay, so I'm going to start going over this chart now. I minimize myself on the screen here. Uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm going to be going over this presentation that has a lot of charts in it. Um, and I'm going to go to this first one here. So this is the Global Competitiveness Report Card. Um, and, okay, I mean, looking... Uh, actually, I think for these uh, rankings, they're from a bunch of different places. So I did mention the World Economic Forum, but there's also International Finance Corporation, Heritage Foundation. These are all... Uh, um, I didn't advocacy, supranationals um, that track countries, that, that measure the, the performance of different countries around the world. So the big thing that uh, Mr. Luz was talking about was, uh, moving myself here, okay, was a doing business report. Uh, so that's, that's number one in this list here. In, uh, and this is from the International Finance Corporation. So we are ranked out of 190 countries, 113. So 113 out of 190. So we're pretty low in the rankings. And Mr. Lewis explicitly said that the government's goal is to be in the top in the top 20% of the rankings. So so basically rank 38 or higher. Oh, it's going to be quite a climb, isn't it? <laughs> From 113 to at least 38. That's uh that's not just climbing. That's uh, leaps and bolts and bounds and you know, pole vaulting to the top, of course. But that's this is what we got to do. Okay, so in order for the government to get the Philippines up there to the top twenty percent, so rank thirty eight or higher from rank one one three, um, Mr. Luz talked about the the about the private sector joining forces with the public sector. So business and government working together to to really improve the situation in this country, which is good, and I I definitely believe in that. And I think we shouldn't be enemies; we should all be friends, you know, hold hands and sing uh, kumbaya. <laughs> but like, no, seriously, um, if we're not antagonistic, if government and business are not antagonistic towards each other, uh, and we all strive for the same goals, I really believe that that that's a way to really improve our standard of living in this country. I mean, think of, I mean, I've talked about Japan numerous times in this podcast, and that's almost a textbook example of how government has worked with business, with even with big business, to, to you know, um, bring up the economy and the standard of living. 
So that's what we want. Um, and I'll get, I want to talk more about that maybe towards the end of the podcast and what the problems are with that. Um, okay. Uh, Bill Luz did mention that we were actually doing okay with this, uh, in this respect, but then we started dropping the rankings. So in the past years, we were actually doing okay, and then we drop. So this is another chart here, and for those of you who are listening audio only, I will describe it. Uh, let me just move myself. Uh, okay. All right. Here we go. Uh, what's up with my mouse? It's acting really weird right now. I wonder if it's a chart. But anyways, um, so from 2011, we were actually moving up. We actually hit a peak for our e for our ranking in a ease of doing business. So um, here we were at 148 at, in 2011, moving up. We actually made it, we actually had an all-time high of 95 in 2015. So that was our peak over, what's this, an eight-year period? Uh, but yeah, but after that we dropped. So from 95, we went to 103, then 99, then 113. So there was almost a plunge in 2018. Not good. So over a five-year, oh no, excuse me, I guess eight-year period, yeah, eight-year period, uh, we actually did quite well, but then dropped. I mean, not as bad as in 2011. So, I mean, you have to give the government props. They they did, you know, there was there was noticeable improvement, but again, we've dropped. And uh, hopefully, and, what I, and, and I, as I've uh, repeated previously in this podcast, uh, it can't be up one year, down the next, like one step forward, one step back. Like even if, if maybe, you know, as long as you're moving forward secularly, meaning like two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. So net net, we're one step forward. That's what we want at least. And we know, and you know, it's very hard to, of course, to have us have a country move up so quickly, pull vault, pull vault, pull vault up the rankings, but we can aspire, can't we? Okay. He also mentioned, uh, Mr. Luz also mentioned, and we're going to scroll down to another chart here. We're pretty low in uh, uh, compared to our ASEAN peers. So if you've noticed um, uh, in the region, Singapore, uh, maybe unsurprisingly, is number one in terms of uh, ease of doing business. And again, they're actually ranked number two as of 2018. We are ranked 113. Indonesia's at 72, Vietnam's at 68, Brunei's at 56, Thailand's at 26, Malaysia's at 24. And what's interesting at this chart is that at the at the right end you might you would see here a change. So there's a there's a on the middle column there's a change. There's a one year change, and then in, in the far right hand column there's an eight year change. So um, in eight years, actually, to be fair, we've actually improved quite a bit. We have actually we're actually up uh, 35 points. Singapore's down one from one to two. Big deal. Uh, you know, it looks like the biggest gainers are Indonesia. So Indonesia is actually way above us now. And also Brunei. So uh, we were up 35 points. But in one year, between 2017 and 2018, uh, our ranking plunged uh, negative, uh, plunged 14 points. If I said if, if I said plunged negative 14, that would be a double, that would be a positive. A double negative is a positive. But anyways plunged 14 points, which is the biggest plunge in the ASEAN region, so that's bad. Uh, something pretty bad must have happened. Um, you know what, um, Mr. Luz didn't talk about what the reason was. I don't think anyone brought it up in the Q&A, but why for this drastic one-year change? I don't know if it's related to Duterte or not, but it is what it is. Uh, okay. Uh, there are a few other things here. Um, Mr. Lewis also talked about how one, one factor is that it's difficult to borrow money in the country because credit information is not widespread. So he actually mentioned that obviously some of the people in the audience are from the fintech sector, so maybe fintech could work it out. Uh, but yeah, there's just some there are just a lot of things that are going into why we're why it's so hard to uh, do business here. Let's see. I'm gonna jump now few slides down to all right charge uh, chart page 16 um, so one one highlight that uh, or negative uh, what would you call it? negative highlight one pain point 
that Mr. Luz was talking about was that for it, when you do business here, it's enforcing contracts. So again, the judicial system. He was talking about how it takes three years for a simple collection case to be heard and decided in court. Just a simple collection case. So if someone doesn't pay or whatever, it takes three years to get that done. So unsurprisingly, in the ranking, in the sub ranking for uh, for the for enforcing contracts when doing business, we are ranked 149. So that's that's really low. Um, Indonesia Indonesia is at 145. Um, Vietnam's at 66. Thailand's at 34. Singapore is number two. So again, uh, the judicial system is again inefficient. So, and I've talked about the ju judicial system several times in this podcast, and it's clearly a recurring theme that something that has to be reformed. Uh, dissolving a company also takes a lot of time here, and so yeah, so there are all these all these sort of things that feed into the overall ranking of why we're why it's so hard to do business in the Philippines. So it looks like the courts have a there's a big um big problem with the courts, and uh, we'll get to that in how how to fix it. We'll get that we'll get to that a bit later in this podcast. Okay, going forward, uh, I'm going to scroll down to chart twenty. Okay, so uh, GDP per capita. So this is a this is a chart from 1994 to 2016. So what's that? A 12 year chart. Um, excuse me, 12 years. <laughs> I mean tw I mean 22 years. <laughs> um, and we've actually grown. I mean, there's we've actually moved up GDP per capita, which is good. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming this chart is adjusted for inflation. It should be real GDP, not nominal. Otherwise, this chart is not really telling us a complete story. But I'm assuming it's it's, it's real GDP. Um, but we're not anywhere near as high as our neighbors. Look at Indonesia; it's really made, been making strides. Thailand, obviously. Uh, Myanmar. That's interesting. So. It's it's uh it's quite interesting and even though like even though some of the people who are ranked lower than us in terms of uh, GDP per, per capita I mean Vietnam maybe right now is lower than us in GDP per capita ranking but I mean if you sell those other rankings like ease of doing business it's generally easier to do it in Vietnam than it is in the Philippines so that's another they might overtake us soon who knows all right um, I'm gonna move now to chart the next chart. Is this chart foreign direct investment net inflows uh, current U.S. dollars? So uh, this is adjusted for inflation. Okay. Okay. Oh, before I before I uh, continue, it says here on the previous chart with the GDP per capita, it says current U.S. dollars. So yeah, it is adjusted for for inflation. So that's yeah, that's real GDP. So yeah, it's a sobering picture. Anyways, going to, back to foreign direct investments, current U.S. dollars. Um, uh FDI has moved up. So uh just to take a step back, foreign direct investment, you might hear this in the in the business press all the time. It's an important number. Uh obviously this is foreign investment into the country, but there there are basically two kinds of foreign investment into a country. There's FDI, so foreign direct investment. There's also portfolio inflows. So portfolio inflows is like uh investing in financial markets. So if you're a foreigner, you invest in like the Philippine stock market, or you buy Philippine bonds, for example. That's that's portfolio inflows or portfolio investments. Foreign direct investment is actually like like putting up a factory here, for example. So that's like a hard asset. Uh, so that's really important because theoretically, um, you know, businesses that are put up here by foreigners generate more jobs and also also provide a more competitive atmosphere for the country and and hence uh, more competition and a higher standard of living because of competition among different local and foreign businesses. So FDI is super important. So uh, to the government's credit, uh, in the what's this, 2011 to 2016, I wonder what 2017 and 2018 is, but like it's actually moved up. So there actually has been, there has been a, quite a run, uh, at least up to 2016. So it's commendable. Uh, um, but again, looking at the following chart, this is a chart comparing uh, the Philippines against uh, ASEAN. We're still quite low. I mean, <laughs> we're ridiculously low. Um, in fact, we were like the lowest performing from 2011, 2012, 2013 in terms of uh, 
excuse me, absolute, <coughs> excuse me, absolute foreign direct investment. But there was a, in, there was a significant increase 2014, 2015, and 2016. There was a higher level investment, but it's still quite low compared to like, uh, obviously Singapore is way, was way above everyone else, but then even, uh, and then Myanmar is higher than us, but yeah. And again, uh, one data point, even though we're doing okay in 2016, one data point does not make a trend. So something we have to watch out for. So FDI is very important. Uh, Mr. Lewis also mentioned that higher ranking countries are generally more, uh, sorry, excuse me, higher ranking countries that, high, countries that rank higher in competitiveness generally do better in foreign direct investment. So yeah, something we need to work on. All right, next chart, chart 26. All right, unemployment rate. We are actually, it's crazy that in, for the most of this chart, so, so from 2011 to 2016, we've had the highest level of unemployment compared to some of our neighbors. So Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand hovering at 7%, but it's come down. So it's come down, but we're still high. It's down to like, I guess that's below 6% in 2016. Uh, on par with Indonesia, but we're still higher in unemployment versus Myanmar, Singapore, and Thailand. Wow, Thailand has like 1% unemployment rate. That's pretty insane. Okay. Um, poverty is the next chart we sh we're going to go over. Um, okay. Poverty incidence in percentage. So, oh, this is not a good picture. We are quite high in a... Well, okay, to be fair, um, this isn't all same year data. I mean, th this data is for like, Philippines in 2015, but like Malaysia in 2008, so that's not really applicable. But let's just look at the 2015 numbers and 2016 numbers. So Indonesia, 2016 is at 10, 11%. Uh, Thailand in 2015 is at 7%. Right? But us, the Philippines in 2015 was 22%. Poverty incidence, so not a good, you know, not a good, uh, not a good way to go. So, all in all, what these charts are showing us is that there has been some improvement, but but we are still not in the clear, and we've obviously I think Indonesia has generally generally overtaken us. Um, so there has been progress, but it's been slow, and I think this past year with the drop in the ease of doing business ranking is not a not a good sign. So. What is it about us? Why are we struggling? I'll get to that at the end of this of this podcast again. Okay. So uh, wrapping at wrapping up like this presentation of charts, Mr. Lewis talked about how uh, he wants um, the um, the private sector to help government make it easier to start a business. Ideally, like in three days or three steps to start a business in the Philippines. That's a, that's the uh, the challenge. Uh, what they want is e-government. So instead of, you know, going and lining up and going through all the traffic just to get permits for this, this, and that to start up your business, you can just do it online. That's that's one specific thing that Mr. Luz wanted uh, to work with the private sector on. So hopefully these uh, aspiring tech entrepreneurs can help with that. Um, so we'll see. Um, there has to be, of course, st stability and predictability in the rules. And Mr. Lewis did concede that there's no magic bill. It, excuse me, no magic bullet. There's not just one problem. There's like a whole bunch of things you have to, you have to fix. Uh, and it's always, it's always uh, the bar always rises in terms of competition. So like, because every every, every country is competing with, for trade, uh, jobs, tourism. Everyone has to keep getting better and better. So that's something that the we need to work, we as a country need to work on. So what the, um, and another thing too, what he did mention that was interesting was that assuming that there are less people having to go to government to do, get this, this or that permit, and it can all be done online, that means fewer, theoretically fewer cars on the road and theoretically at least slightly less traffic. So, you know, that could help. <laughs> um, okay. You talked about design sprints. I'm, I'm not familiar with this term, but what I gather from it is that uh, there, my understanding is that uh, the government wants to work with some of the uh, tech startups here 
and really focus on creating these websites or these e-portals or whatever and like really grinding it out like in a really short amount of time that's my interpretation of what the design sprint is but you know you can check it out for yourself but that's basically what what uh mr Luz's push was for the audience in this in this talk so i want to talk a bit about the q a so actually um under secretary tarado actually joined mr Luz uh in the q a session um one thing that someone brought up was that i mean how can we be sure and this this is obviously like the elephant in the room right how can even whatever the uh changes the positive changes that are made in this in the, in the current administration how can you be sure that these changes are kept or maintained in the next administration so obviously the um Mr. Luz and Ms. Tarado obviously conceded that, I mean, change has to be institutionalized, uh, embedded. Um, the easiest way, I think this was Mr. Luz talking, the easiest way to institutionalize change is to have it done by law. But, you know, you can't wait for Congress. I mean, he was being very realistic. You can't wait for Congress to pass these laws. I mean, <laughs> it might, you know, it could be stuck forever in limbo. So create the system already. Uh, and I think what he was what he was alluding to was again technological change. I think that's actually smart because I mean to Mr. Luz's credit, uh, you know politics hampers a lot of things. Uh, if there's tech innovation that can that can sort of leap ahead of the political problems and then really just <laughs> create the change without dealing with the politics, uh, that's that's a net net good thing for the country, I believe. You know, and that's a, that's almost a way to circumvent. Uh, all the political stalemates that we have in this country that where, you know, so obviously things don't get done. Uh, um, someone did brought, bring up the fact that someone in the audience talked about how there are real human, there's a human element of the bottlenecks in this process of, of doing business in the Philippines. Uh, one example given was that if, if say like you want, you need to register your business and like there's one guy Who's in charge of it? He just he just goes on leave for like whatever reason, like vacation or state visit, like everything stops for that day. Um, yeah, that's an obvious one. Um, and it's, what what I thought was interesting was that uh, in, in in this gentleman's experience, uh, you know, filing or registering with the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, uh, when, you, when you use the word platform, uh, the SEC, SEC thinks you're a media company and. The government, maybe some people in the government think that you have the intent to break the law. So it seems to, it seems to him like there's already a level of mistrust between government and business. So this is a very big problem which we have to fix. So why can't we trust each other? Why can't we give each other hugs, you know? Um, so yeah, that has to change. But I, I think it's a good step forward that these two representatives of government were reaching out to the private sector. I think it's a great step forward. And I think... People kind of know what some of the some of the first steps are to really fix things here, so it's good. Um, uh, Mr. Rado also said that there's just know the answer for like change. Uh, um, you can't change a culture overnight, and again, culture. So again, this is what I'm going to be talking about at the end. It takes time. So um, it takes time to do things like that, and but then and maybe there. And then she mentioned. Maybe there should be an evangelist for this kind of change and advocacy. Raising my hand, that's what I want to do. That's me. First World Manila. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, um, Torado also mentioned that if they meet their targets, so if, if these government employees meet their targets, they get a bonus. So that's good. That's good that there's uh, more f uh, financial incentives for government employees to perform. That's, that's, a, that's a positive. So I think everyone knows like what has to be done more or less. So um, for the design sprint, there is more detail given about the, the design sprint. They have the funding to do this apparently. Uh, one thing, I think there are, there are three steps that Mr. Luz and Ms. Torado mentioned uh, for the design sprint. The first is a, is a knowledge database, like i.e. Wikipedia. So that makes sense, organizing information, that's always helpful. Um, you know, uh, one form, one portal. So I guess I guess that's number two. So that's a centralization of everything. Okay, yeah, idiot proof. Uh, number three, end-to-end -end process. No human intervention. So you can do it on your own. You don't need to again. Don't need to go line up and 
go see all these agencies and go through the traffic to set up a business. So I guess the gold standard is New, are New Zealand and Singapore, which, is, which are ranked number, number one and number two, respectively, in terms of ease of doing business. So um, Mr. Lewis, I think it was Mr. Lewis mentioned that there is, uh, for the SEC to maybe be updated in terms of its, uh, its, um, excuse me, its uh, laws to make it more, I guess, business friendly. And this is just changing gears a bit. Uh, there is no constitutional change needed for the change the SEC. Uh, it can be amended by uh, the SEC is governed by the by a corporation code, which can be amended. So that's good. Um, but again, it still has to go through Congress. But it's not. A, there's no constitutional change needed for that. Uh, there can be there could be a few things that can be amended in, in the corporation code, like you talked about uh, removing a minimum capitalization requirement, uh, attack it on after registration. I'm not sure what he meant by that. Uh, again, why why all this notarization and bank certification requirement? Again, all this red tape when you register for a business, it's ridiculous. Um, but it's hard because I mean he did mention the political side of it, which is that if you if you change these, if you do this corporation code change in the SEC, people will lose jobs. But of course, the upside is theoretically that there are more businesses who can then, who can hire these people who lose jobs. But that's very difficult to tell people that. <laughs> so yeah, um, so yeah, my okay. That that's that's it more or less for this, uh, this for the the presentation on ease of doing business and the Q and A session. I just want to give some some comments, my overall comments and thoughts. This, these are a lot of good initiatives, so I really commend um, Mr. Lewis and uh, Sec Under Secretary Tarada for really reaching out to the private sector and making it explicit that, hey, we need to work together to change these things. And I realized, and we really we realized that uh, a lot of things need to be changed. And you know, if we work together, we can fix these things. So I think it's great. I think it's great that they're reaching out. I'm, I'm very, I'm very happy this is happening. This conversation is happening. That's why I'm sharing it to you, my dear podcast, my dear podcast listeners. <clears throat> uh, again, the elephant in the room, and again, I want to talk about this now, is culture. Uh, will the change be institutionalized without a uh, cultural change? Cultural change takes a long time, and I've, I've kind of hinted at it throughout this throughout this uh, particular podcast, like the judiciary, SEC. Uh, there has to be cultural change where you put uh, the country, the nation, over your own self-interest. So, and as many of my long-term listeners know, like that is part of my job here at First Open is to help is to use aspiration um, and branding to create a stronger national identity, which is why I do so many episodes on culture and identity. That is inspirational for people uh, people can aspire to that will overcome self-interest and and I want to just be fair here it's not just people in the government for, for their self-interest it's everyone's society so you know we can't just keep pointing our fingers at the government everyone has to change for the better and lead, lead each other by example um, you know it's not like for example like maybe some of you are pretty well off and just want to leave this country and not come back I mean don't you think maybe that that's part of the problem like you also have to love this country too and be able to put the betterment of it beyond your own self-interest uh, even if you're in the private sector and you're not in government and I know that's hard but you but try and be smart about it and of course maybe you want to go abroad temporarily just to learn skills and then come back and do something good for the country but but please realize that you are also in this fight and all of us need to come together to really really fix fix the problems here and I think I think uh, I think uh, Bill Luz is right in that the pri the public and private sector have to join hands in this. Yeah, so that's it for today's episode. Um, speaking of culture, a uh, little Spanish Tagalog lesson. So I want to talk about articles now. Um, articles, obviously, um, ang in Tagalog, so ang aso or ang bahay. There's, there's that ang is an article. It's like I'm not sure what the what the uh, the the textbook definition of that is but ang right what's interesting in spanish is that the article has gender so there's a gender uh in the articles so like there's l for masculine like a noun 
in Spanish has a gender, so it's either masculine or feminine. In Tagalog, we don't have uh, gender for our nouns, like ang aso, ang pusa, ang, ang bahay, ang koche, right? There's no, there's no gender, but in Spanish there is. So, uh, translation, el perro, uh, el gato, la casa, uh, el coche. El is for masculine nouns, la is for feminine nouns. Is it hard? Yes. That basically means if you want to get better in Spanish, you have to know which nouns are masculine and which nouns are feminine. But there's there, there are ways to know. Uh, but again, uh, it, it's important for us because to respect our national culture and heritage, I'm a very big believer that we should also know how to speak Spanish. Uh, but so that's it. So, el, el, and la. So, like, um, ang pusa, uh, the cat. El gato. Gato is a masculine noun. Cat, el, el gato. Ang bahay, so the house. La casa, la feminine casa house so house is a feminine noun in spanish so el la uh, masculine and feminine okay that's it for today uh, i will see you guys next week if you like what you listen to please think about subscribing uh social media links are below are in the description and i will see you next week uh have a good day bye bye hasta luego